Hey guys, welcome back. Hope everybody's staying safe out there. I uh, put together this lecture for you because I wanted to uh, review some ideas that we had learned this semester. I thought it'd be a good idea to go back and spiral in some things that we already knew before we move forward. So I know I had assigned uh, some Civil War stuff on Achieve 3000. Hopefully all you guys are doing that. Those, will be put, those grades will be put in for the six, six weeks. Um, but I thought we could take a break from Achieve and we could go old school, Mr. Moss style, and have a discussion, one-way discussion, over uh, some ideas we've learned this year so far. So if I want to go back to the idea of sectionalism. If you remember, we talked about sectionalism. There are three sections. There's the northern section, which is primarily industrial and urban with lots of cities and people crammed together in apartments and, and um, you know living close together and working in factories, things like that, real industrial. We have the southern region, which is mostly agrarian, uh, agriculture, farming, everybody's spread out in this rural um, environment. And then we have the western section, which is um, people that have chosen to go on west on the um, Mormon Trail, the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, people that went west to find gold, um, people who are pioneers, explorers. Um, so you have these three different kinds of Americans at this point. You have the uh, Northerners, the Southerners, and the Westerners. So you don't really have a United States. You have kind of three, three different kinds of three sections in this country, and most aren't relatable. All right, cool. So let's go back to Andrew Jackson. I know, like I said earlier, we were uh, discussing Civil War, but I think we need to remember how we got to Civil War. So who can tell me something Andrew Jackson did that really began a, a rift or started the country, uh, at, you know, really divided the country? Yes, you in the back, Octavio, yes, that's correct. He said the nullification crisis. Excellent, so let's talk about what Jackson dealt with in the nullification crisis. So the word nullify, remember, is to get rid of the law. Okay, so remember, the reason we're calling it the nullification crisis is because South Carolina, the state we always talk about, does not want to follow the law. So let's push pause, let's back up. Andrew Jackson, we know, believes in Jacksonian democracy. He believes that all common men should be able to vote. It's like white common men. Um, so he's really popular among people who aren't rich, white men who aren't rich. He is a war hero from the War of 1812, so he has all this clout, so he um, kind of becomes president through that. Um, when he becomes president, he kind of doesn't, is not very, uh, He's very hard to get along with and he's very tyrannical. Remember the Whigs, um, the opposite party Jackson was in, Jackson was in the Democrats. Um, the Whigs didn't like them, kind of like um, the Democrats and Republicans are two different parties. We had the Whigs and we had the Democrats. Um, so Jackson is our first true Democrat president and the Whigs don't like him. They, they uh, make caricatures of him. They made the cartoon where he's addressed like a king. call him a tyrant. I think it says actually King Andrew I. He's standing on a shredded constitution. He has a veto thing in his hand. You remember. So we know that Jackson has this reputation for being tyrannical. Well, Jackson basically is saying, you know, like uh, through Congress, they're passing all these laws. And so Jackson agrees with this tariff law. Now this tariff law, remember a tariff is any tax on imports. All the northern states like this new tariff law, but the southern states do not like it. South Carolina stands up to Andrew Jackson, uh, led by uh, Vice President John C. Calhoun, and says, we don't want to pay the tariff. We don't want to pay the tax on imports. So you're going to have to just let us not pay it. And Andrew Jackson, you know, in classic Andrew Jackson fashion, says, everyone's going to pay it. You're going to pay it too. And they said, no, we're not. We might even secede, which of course, remember, means we might even break away. And so that is what I want to focus on right now is this moment where South Carolina says out loud, we might break away from the United States because we don't like a law that's being passed. That's interesting because 
that shows the beginning of the rift between the northern section and the southern section and most of the southern states agree with South Carolina now Andrew Jackson didn't let them say that very long because remember from class we learned the threat he made I'll hang the first man that tries to secede from a tree so Andrew Jackson was very like controlling so the minute South Carolina threatens this he says no you're not he sends the army down there Andrew Jackson has every intention of forcing South Carolina into submission and who comes and saves the day. Think for a minute about who do we learn about in American history who's known as the great compromiser and he always comes in with a plan, with a compromise, with a deal. And he always comes in with this like, you know, great solution. Three, two, one. That's right, Henry Clay. Okay, cool, so Henry Clay has an idea. Why don't we just keep a tariff in place but lower it? That way South Carolina doesn't get affected economically by this thing as bad as it would have been. And then everybody goes, okay, I can live with that. Andrew Jackson says, okay. South Carolina says, okay. It's a miracle. We don't go to civil war, okay? So around 1830, we would have gone to civil war. Thank God we didn't. Okay, so that's kind of putting into, you know, showing us who Andrew Jackson is and what the climate of the country is during that time period. Cool. Um... We talked about Jackson being a common man. Okay, cool. Let's talk about the National Bank. Andrew Jackson also decided he didn't like this, the second National Bank. Um, he wanted to take it down. He thought it only benefited rich people. And, you know, Andrew Jackson being um, the common man president, uh, he had to fight for the common man, the common white man. And so he decided he was going to take all the money out of the National Bank and put that money into state banks so everyone could... He felt like that was more fair. And he took down the National Bank. And that was a war that no one thought that Andrew Jackson would win. And of course he did, because he's Andrew Jackson. That's what he does. Let's talk about something pretty serious. So there was a um, situation where gold was found in, in Georgia. All these Cherokee Indians had been told they can stay in Georgia if, as long as they farm and they, and they work as like most white men would work and they actually try to be part of the society. Well, they, they began to do that. And gold was found in Georgia and all these white people wanted to come and move in and take the land from the Indians because they, you know, it's gold. So the, uh, the court case was known as Worcester versus Georgia. We learned about this as well. Um, this, you know, the Indians were represented by a man named Worcester who said, hey, um, you know, these Indians deserve to stay. And the state of Georgia says, no, they don't. And Worcester was this missionary that really was trying to do the right thing. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled, yeah, Worcester's right. The Indians can stay. And Georgia, no, you can't have the land. The white people cannot move in and take the land. And Andrew Jackson said, we're going to pass the bill called the Indian Removal Act anyway. Let Congress enforce the law, or let the Supreme Court enforce the law if they want. John Marshall was the uh, Supreme Court Justice. I think the actual quote was, John Marshall has made his ruling, now let's see him enforce it. So, of course, we know that's going to lead to the Trail of Tears. Um, on the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee were moved from Georgia. And out of 16,000 Cherokee that were moved from the, um, from the southeast, um, out of those 16,000, 4,000 died from exhaustion and hunger and the cold. And it's one of the saddest moments in American history. Um, and um, also on the Indian Re Removal Act was a, a total of five tribes, including the Cherokee, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. All those tribes were moved from the east of the Mississippi River to the west of the Mississippi River in the area we now call Oklahoma. I know you guys remember all this because I taught it so well. Okay, um, that's pretty much all I want to talk about with Andrew Jackson today. All right, so let's talk a minute about how other things are changing, not just you know, we're not just moving people off their land, we're not just going through an industrial revolution. Also, you know, things are uh, changing in art and music and reform is happening and, and prisons and, and every on all walks of life. So I thought we could maybe just talk about some of that stuff really quickly, just as a review. So in literature, people start writing these American novels like 
uh, the Scarlet Letter, we talked about that. Uh, another big one, oh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. I uh, know some of you people uh, wrote, read uh, Cask of Amontillado, where he takes uh, the cask of Amontillado, excuse me, where he takes the guy down to, he says he has his cask of wine and he gets him really uh, sauced up and then he uh, takes him into his basement and breaks him up. Um, you know, also we have this transcendentalist movement, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, where people, you know, believe that, you know, nature and God can be found, um, or God can be found in nature. Uh, cool. Let's talk about some art. So we have John James Audubon, this artist that's painting birds, and we had some of that art that we looked at where he went around all of, of the west of, of, the, of the United States, and he painted all these birds, hundreds of um, portraits of birds. I mean, it's like the beginning of National Geographic. Cool, we also have the Hudson River Skull opening where now, you know, it used to be, hey, paint this man's portrait, hey, paint this military hero's portrait, paint this president's portrait, paint them from from right in front of them where they're looking at the, the artist. Well, now these people are like, well, forget all that. We're gonna start painting beautiful landscapes. In the West, you know, it's so unexplored that we have all these like, you know, beautiful backdrops. So um, we have all these artists go through um, the Hudson River School, like Thomas Cole, and they're painting these uh, beautiful paintings. Cool. Um, make sure I covered everything with you guys. Okay, that's art. That's enough for art. Let's go to. Let's go to abolition. Let's talk about reform and abolition. Okay, cool. So we know that slavery is really popular in the South because of the cash crops. Now, just around you know. After 1830s, after the cotton gin's invented, cotton becomes the new cash crop that's overtaking tobacco because now you can clean cotton so much faster. And as America is moving west in this manifest destiny, places like Texas and Louisiana are going to be perfect places to grow cotton. And so you're going to have an increase in demand for cotton, which means an increase in demand for slavery. And since the cotton gin can pick the seeds so fast, slavery is going to increase um, greatly. Um, People, mostly in the North, there were some Southerners, but mostly in the North um, believed in abolition. Uh, and some of these abolitionists we talked about were Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, William Lloyd Garrison, John Brown. So we can unpack some of these people in a minute. We'll talk about how they're different. Um, we also had a woman, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. If you remember this book, described how um, slaves were treated and they were um, abused and mistreated. And when that book hit bookstores, people began to read about, hey, this is what slavery is like. And people were outraged. So that kind of draw, drew people's attention to how you know the, the horrible uh, things, the atrocities that came with slavery. Um, okay, you know, Harriet Tubman, of course, on the Underground Railroad, um, she went back and freed lots of uh, slaves, and after she was already free, she went back and helped many others um, on the Underground Railroad. Um, we talked about um, Frederick Douglass, uh, he used to be a slave, and he had a newspaper called the uh, North Star, uh, so the newspaper would talk about, um, you know, why slavery is wrong and trying to get people on board with abolition. You also have people, um, William Lloyd Garrison, a white newspaper man who started a newspaper called The Liberator to free, uh, to help free slaves from bondage. Uh, that was his whole thing. And let's talk about John Brown for a minute. So John Brown's this really interesting character, um, person in history that is very polarizing. Some people think he's a hero. Some people think that he is a total villain. violence to get his point across and uh, but he's also responsible for being um, you know a leader in the slave movement he was he was hanged for his actions and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in a minute about John Brown but at the end of his life he was hanged for um, Harper's the Harper's Ferry incident and uh, he you know was a martyr to many for slavery okay I'm gonna talk for about five more minutes I don't want to bore everybody. Too late. Cool. Some other reform stuff. We talked about Dorothea Dix and mental health care facilities. We talked about how um, 
jail and um, or prisons, jails and prisons, and then mental hospitals were not separated back then. That was one big problem. And so her whole goal was to separate those two things because someone who is a murderer that wants to do evil things and someone who is a person that suffers from mental health, um, has mental health issues, uh, there are two different types of people. And so she wanted to separate those out. She also saw how they treated people in mental hospitals and they would use them and put them in cages and beat them into submission. And, and the place, the, both prisons and mental hospitals were dirty and there was lots of disease because of things weren't clean. So she really pushed to have all that, you know, improved. Hence the word reform. We also have um, Horace Mann who's responsible for everyone, including me having a job and you having a school to go to. Everyone has access to public education, free public education. He was the first one to ever do that. Um, he said education is the great equalizer. That means that, that means that anybody, well, I think we talked about it in class, but to me it means you could be from anywhere in the world, but in America, you get free education and you want to be somebody one day. If you're educated, you can do it. It takes all the other qualifiers out of the loop. If you're educated, that means that you're prepared. Cool. Let's talk really quickly about the women's suffrage movement. So we had, in 1848, we had the Seneca Falls Convention in Seneca Falls, New York, and you had Susan B. Anthony, and you had Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and many other women and men that attended this thing and they were all trying to get women the right to vote. And they basically redrafted the Declaration of Independence. Um, and they, had the, they redrafted their own version called the Declaration of Sentiments. And many of the words they just changed to uh, men and women, and then they kind of put their message in the middle. And they were just trying to piggyback on what we had, you know, some of our founding documents. They were just trying to show everybody, hey, this is a fundamental thing, and women should be treated equally, and they should get the right to vote. Um, you know, just a side note, not all women felt this way, uh, but, but many women wanted the right to vote. Um, so this was uh, in July of 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention, and uh, unfortunately all those women that fought for that did not gain the right to vote, but they did draw attention to the issue, and we know that in 1920 women finally got the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Okay, cool. Let's go with the temperance movement. Temperance movement is a movement that kind of pre, a precursor to prohibition. The temperance movement is a, a reform movement that says, hey, alcohol is not good and it is the root of all evil and we need to have people stop drinking alcohol in large quantities. We need to have you know, less alcohol consumed. Um, so many women supported this because there were a lot of drunk husbands and there were a lot of just drunk people period that weren't being productive and so this is going to lead to the 18th amendment the prohibition of alcohol which you know the 21st amendment will repeal that later but so in 19 so in 19 19 alcohol is forbidden and then in 19 1933 1932 1933 they repeal alcohol and so, but the, all you need to know from my class is that the Timbers movement was the precursor to that. Another reform movement for you. Cool. Let's talk really quickly about, um, you know, the nation breaking apart and why we went to Civil War. We talked earlier about slavery. We talked about sectionalism. We know the other cause of the Civil War. We talked about for, let's see, slavery, sectionalism. We talked about the election of Lincoln, right? And, um, Oh, of course, states' rights. I'm sorry. So we have these four causes of the Civil War, and that's what we want to remember as we talk about these these um, ideas. Okay, so we have uh, a new court case that comes along called the Dred Scott Court Case. So Dred Scott was a slave, and his, he was in the North with his owner, and his owner dies, and Dred Scott assumes, "Hey, I'm a free man now because, um, you know, my master's dead." 
and the family sued or the family says no you're going to be our slave still because you're property and he says no I don't think so well he takes his case to the court house and then it goes from one court to the next to the next all the way up to the Supreme Court the highest court and the Supreme Court uh, I think it was Roger B. Taney says the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice says sorry bro you're a property you're not an individual you lose and he remains a slave it says a lot about the the government in the in the 19th century about how they felt about supporting minorities and how they felt about supporting people and you know that's pretty telling cool um, let's do one last thing today let's talk about the compromise of 1850 Okay, so the Compromise of 1850 is going to be basically Henry Clay's last dance. The country's being torn apart every day by over these issues of states' rights and slavery and, and the sectional differences, and, and people don't know what to happen. Remember, we talked about every time a new state is added through Manifest Destiny, Every time you add a free state, you need to add a slave state. Every time you add a slave state, you need to add a free state. And so this is like a temporary solution because we know you can't keep this up. So this is a real problem. Henry Clay, you know, is going to do one last Band-Aid on this. And then after he's going to be dead, no one else is going to be there to fix the problems, which is going to, you know, another reason, you know, if you want to say reason why, why the Civil War happened, Henry Clay's gone. So um, the Compromise of 1850 has, a, has, you know, four main components. Okay, so um, I'll read to you what I wrote on these notes here and then we can explain it. Okay, so the North and South were split on many issues, what to do with all this new land in the West. New states added affected the balance, I talked about that. The idea of breaking California into, stu into two different states, one free and one state, that was an idea I brought up, but they didn't like it. Congress brought in Henry Clay. Okay, so here's the four parts that Henry Clay said. Everybody just chill out and I'll solve it. All right, number one, California is going to be a free state. I don't want to hear arguments about it. It's going to be a free state. All right. Two, no more slavery in Washington, D.C. That's pretty huge because Washington, D.C. is in the South, but it's the, you know, the nation's capital city. So, you know. Number three, the remainder of the Mexican session. If you remember, when we fought Mexico in the, American, in the, in the um, U.S. Mexican War, we won. And they signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and they gave us all this land in the Southwest, you know, where California and Nevada and Arizona is, okay? So New Mexico will be there. So we got all that land. So number three says the remainder of the Mexican session is open to slavery. So that means if people move into this land and they want to have slaves, they can vote on that. Popular, that's right, popular sovereignty. Okay, four, there's a law that's passed. Think one... Think for a second, what law was passed that really helped slave owners? If you remember, it was called the Fugitive Slave Act, which meant if a slave ran away, you had to, under the law, report that slave and snitch on them and help them get turned back into their masters. So that's kind of the four parts of the Compromise of 1850. Everybody was happy with those four things. Well, everybody was relatively happy with those four things. And that's what, um, that's basically what the Compromise of 1850 is. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put this lecture on Google Classroom and I'm going to have some questions for you. Okay? I'm going to have you answer the questions. It's going to be simple, but I would like for you to fill out the questions just so I know that you're with me and turn that in and that will be the assignment. Okay? Yeah, I think that's enough for today. Hope everybody's feeling good. Uh, I miss teaching you guys. I miss being at school with y'all. Um, you know, I miss the normalcy of just having a routine. But we're all in this together. So if anybody needs anything from me, uh, feel free to email me. And I guess I'll talk to y'all soon.